So uh, I want to talk a little bit more about about op amps, but I thought I'd uh, before that I'd uh, share a little bit of some some papers I found this morning. <coughs> the uh, if you're if you're looking for work on pulse plethysmograph or you're trying to find data on it, it turns out that the search term that works best is photoplethysmograph. And the reason for that is that a plethysmograph is a general volume sensing device. And the old version of this would be to put a, a, a band around a, an extremity and then watch the extremity with a strain gauge on it and watch the extremity change shape. And that was referred to as a plethysmograph. So <clears throat> photoplethysmograph here makes it clear that to the it's a search term for infrared, turns out. And that works better than IR plethysmograph by far. The uh, there's some interesting results. It turns out that I, I think I was earlier when we were talking about uh, the plethysmograph was saying that it, I thought it might be possible to get blood pressure from plethysmograph but I wasn't sure how well it turns out it is and the way you do it is to put two of these things on your body at different distances from your heart and measure the velocity of the pulse wave of the pressure wave and the velocity of the pressure wave turns out to be highly correlated with blood pressure so what some people have done is to put put a, a sensor on the fingertip and another one on the ankle and measure the distance between them probably relative to the heart and you can um, you can um, get the blood pressure from that some other stuff too so measure it correlates well the velocity correlates well with um, uh, blood system health flexibility but one of the I haven't been able to figure out how I, mean, I only had it for a week I looked at the there's there's I've gone obviously to the settings and look for power settings and I can't find any timeouts on it. I'll look some more. But one of the things that's been done is to is to make uh, portable systems so that you could monitor people all the time. And so what they were doing is to is to they made a ring. They made a ring that had a complete plethysmograph in it. Sends light through your finger and back out again. And um, one version of it, one version of it, uh, also has an accelerometer on it. And, uh, it has LEDs. It has a pusher so that you can do mechanical pressure to figure out what's going on. And one version also has an accelerometer, which allows you to negate motion artifacts to some extent. And So, so yeah, the acceleration sensors uh, allow you to get rid of some of the um, some of the motion artifact. And I got I got to love this. That's what the thing looks like when they build it. I'd wear one of those in a heartbeat. I, I think this would be could use some more miniaturization, but it's RF linked. It's a uh, standalone. Uh, it does the uh, pulse. It uh, uh, has a force transducer. It's got all the optical stuff on it. It's very cool. And the idea would be that you would wear this all the time. And it would just be a passive monitor of your cardiac state. And these waveforms should look pretty familiar to you by this point. So there's lots of information out there. Um, I found some other, a uh, lot of papers on, uh, on pulse wave velocity and uh, plethysmogra plethysmography. So if you, if you, 
could make a good final project. Dual channel plethysmograph uh, calibrated for blood pressure. Yeah, I see people walking around with all these things on their clipped on their big toe and yeah, special shoes. But uh, probably ankle is is good enough. So. Um, So that's uh, there's a source of there's a large source of information, background information about plethysmography. If you want to if you want to pursue that, um, any questions about uh, the uh, EMG? measurements. Let's see, you're starting that this week? Next week. This is the last of the plethysmograph. So you're checking off today. Okay. So the pl so this so if you want to get some so it's timely in terms of writing up the plethysmograph uh, um, uh, lab report. If you go off and Google, if you Google a photoplethysmography, you will find lots of information in the literature to compare your measurements to, uh, which could be useful for lab write-up. So, yeah. Some of the books carry some, uh, I mean, some recommended algorithms, or some of these papers have some algorithms to actually get yeah, there's quite a lot of information on on uh, on uh, data data reduction, I including some people that say that the baseline variability carries a lot of information, and that when you see this this waveform changing baseline that the shape of this baseline carries information about your the state of your cardiovascular system also. I, see, I just looked this up this morning and I haven't had a chance to look at it very carefully but uh, uh, there's lots of there's lots that's been done on this dozens hundreds of papers there's lots to look up there's lots of it's a fertile ground for final projects too So, last time uh, I was trying to uh, I tried to see if anybody had any uh, feelings about what uh, or any hypotheses about what sort of uh, lab lab four should be. Has anybody thought about that? The heart cells, uh, sort of uh, circuit uh, simulation of of heart cells, the skin skin impedance, because you want to see more real measurements as opposed to the. All right. Any other? Any other? Uh, Opinions. So you see if um, you see the, the heartbeat that we have, you can see the respiratory movements. If we would alter that slightly, what would we be doing? In some simulated manner. Say that again. I'm sorry. So you have a specific timing of peaks and um, yeah, stole and that sort of thing. Yeah. So if we alter that somehow in a simulation. So you're saying if you were to make the peak abnormal controllably, how would it affect? Well, that's that's certainly that that's a, so you're asking if you change the electrical characteristics of the heart, what happens? So, for instance, if you drop the sodium concentration, this peak goes down, and you can ask then what happens to the heart rate? Yeah. 
when you when you do that. And you could certainly do that. Or the pumping efficiency, although that then requires a, a, a model of how the electrical events coupled to the mechanical events, but you could probably come up with that. That would be, that, that's, that's certainly a possibility. So, I have two opinions here. Any other opinions? Roland? Say again? Digital thermometer. So, making a measurement of a, on, on human temperature. Is that what you're saying? Uh, and so there's, there's, a, there's a, a number of different methods that are used to measure temperature. One is the infrared, infrared thermometer. I, I, any of you had this done? They stick an infrared thermometer in your ear and measure the ear temperature. Uh, I've never had my temperature measured that way, but that works. There's also... Um, um, of course, analog temperature sensitive sensors that are more or less fast. Problem with measuring surface te temperature is that it's not very well correlated with internal temperature. If you're going to measure internal temperature, then you have to have a sensor that can survive in your mouth or, or armpit or someplace that's warmer than the surface of your skin. Um, So what is the, so there's, the, there's a couple of possibilities on that. There are different sensors that are available. How would you make a digital system? I mean, one possibility is you, you take the output of the thermal sensor and you put it into, the, into MATLAB, right? And you track the temperature as a function of time. Uh, it's unfortunately so slowly varying in most people that you would be lab would end before you saw any variation. So this would be the kind of experiment you do for 24 hours or so. And then you do see variation in your temperature. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out how I'd put that into a lab format. So it's pretty easy to do that with a, if you take an LM34 temperature sensor, it reads out a voltage which is proportional to degrees Fahrenheit. No, but then you have to, it's pretty Yeah. How would infrared under one The infra infrared one might be interesting. I, it doesn't emit, it's passive infrared. It measures the infrared coming off of your body. That could be fun. Because then you would have to it out. I mean, it out. Yeah, let me uh, let me look into that. Let me uh, I'll, I'll, uh, let me see if it's possible to to get IR sensors. Any sort of reasonable way. All right. Well, that's three possibilities. I'm not hearing a strong feeling here, though. It's, uh, it's hard to get strong feelings out of students any time in the middle of the semester when they're busy and sleep deprived. Unless, of course, you're offering free pizza. But, all right. So, I will I'll look at the infrared option and see if there's see if there's something interesting and doable there. Um, otherwise so otherwise we'll probably go with the default, which will be the skin impedance. And one thing I haven't mentioned for the EMG stuff is that there's a correlational experiment. I'm going to ask you to 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 in, in, instrument some muscle, probably bicep, and then put a force transducer on your finger and then push on the bottom of the table like this, which will load your bicep. Okay? And I want you to be able, I want you to, uh, I want to, like a relationship between the size, duration, 
integral whatever works of the EMG and the force you're expending, the force you're putting out. The force sensors uh, are, are log linear uh, between uh, 10 grams and 10 kilograms. I, most of you are not going to probably want to put out more than 10 kilograms pushing on the bottom of the table, although some of you can probably flip the table over by doing that. Uh, and uh, in which case, uh, be a little moderate about your upper body strength. But uh, <clears throat> uh, the, 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 the four sensors are thin film sensors. They are easy to put on a fingertip and just push against the table with that finger and you should be able to get a reading off of them. You're going to make another voltage divider using this. <clears throat> the, the, it's a resistive sensor. You're going to use it to make a voltage divider using the resistive sensor and then calibrate it. Hmm, how do you calibrate a force sensor? Hmm, you need known forces. Well, maybe we ought to go get some canned peas or something. You know, canned goods are in nice one pound calibrated allotments, so you could stack them up. Or dog food, I got some nice dog food cans, so I'm going to do that. You can stack them up, and I'll bring in five or six dog food cans, and we can see how linear they are. Or weight set. Is it just yeah, maybe I have I have some I have I think uh, I don't think uh, my wife had some one pound weights. I've got some little two and a half pound discs and fives and tens. I don't think I have anything in between that. Um, but you'll but you will there's a drawer in the third cabinet that that is marked for sensors. And you'll want to grab one of those. Are those transparent ones? They are a little better than those. I, last year, or last year, four years ago, I got a donation from a company. You had to cut out the force sensor with scissors and then flex the bend them over yourself, and they kept flying open and they were hard to handle and they didn't have connectors on them and so on and so on. The new ones are connectorized. They have pins on them that you can alligator clip to or solder to, and uh, they they don't fly open and they're and they're uh, much more calibrated. So, What we were talking about last time was silver silver chloride electrodes and and why they mattered. Um, and the summary is that you have a reversible reaction at the surface of the silver uh, uh, at the silver electrode that um, shares a re shares a chemical component chloride with the solution, and so you can pass ions back and forth from the silver to the solution and thereby carry current. Silver chloride is you can you can chloride a silver wire very easily by um, question? Yep. By I mean this if it's because of chlorine and some metal then so, so the the so the 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 nice thing about silver metal is that if you put it in contact with saline solution, it sits there. You take sodium metal and put it in contact with a saline solution, and it detonates because the the so the sodium is is has a We'll, we'll pull the oxygen off of the water and release hydrogen, which then explodes. And so, silver is unusual in that it is not reactive, and it shares a. It, it makes a material, silver chloride, which is compatible with chlorine ions that are in solution. 
If you take a if you take a one and a half volt battery and put it between two silver wires that are submerged in potassium chloride or sodium chloride solution, positive charges pulling pulling electrons off of here will end up uh, attaching chlorides to this silver wire. And you can start with a bright silver wire turn on a switch and within a few seconds this wire will turn kind of a, a grayish brownish color which is a silver chloride layer. It's photosensitive. Silver chloride is is in film, right? That's a film compound. And so it tends to it tends to oxidize back to, to silver but but um, you, can, you can build a silver chloride electrode this way, but nobody does that for, for physiological recording uh, anymore. But rather, as I think I said last time, you, you buy a pellet of sintered silver, silver chloride. You take a silver dust, a silver chloride dust, you press them together under pressure around a wire, and you have an electrode. If you want these two electrodes to be exactly the same potential, oh, yes, uh, if, if you buy pre-gelled, oh yeah, before I do that though, so let's say that you have, you have one of these, these pellet electrodes that are that's sitting here and you drop it in, in chloride, into sodium, into potassium chloride, the effective poten potential of the silver silver chloride depends on the chloride concentration in the solution around it because it's a half cell, it's a battery. To make the electrode be moderately constant voltage, you have to surround this silver silver chloride pellet with an environment that has a constant chloride concentration in it. There's a few ways to do that, but commercial electrodes typically have, are typically pre-gelled. That is to say, they are silver silver chloride pellets with a little pocket of, of some sort of polymer around them, maybe a polyethylene polymer that's saturated with, silver, with chloride solution and when you put it against your skin, it does not change chloride concentration and so the potential is is uniform and constant. Pre-gelled electrodes, so pre-gelled pre-gelled electrodes are supposed to be matched within about 150 microvolts. So they should all have the same voltage within 150 microvolts. And, I'm sorry, within 100 microvolts. And the noise, any, any, any noise associated with that should be, the uh, broadband noise should be less than 150 microvolts. And the impedance at, at 10 hertz should be less than or equal to 2k ohms. If you want to make sure that your electrodes have the same potential and low noise, you can take several of them, short them together, so you have electrode 1, electrode 2, and electrode 3, you short all their leads together, you put them in saline and let them sit overnight. And they'll act as shorted batteries and they'll all come to the same potential. Most of the time for physiological recording from humans you don't care about that because almost everything you do is AC coupled. And so you ignore the small DC offsets between the electrodes. If you're doing some very specific animal physiology, sometimes you have to make sure you have extremely low offsets. When I used to do this, I used to short them overnight to make sure that the 
that the electrodes were within a few microvolts of each other. The impedance also of these, of these electrodes is rather constant between 10 and 10 kilohertz. You would expect the impedance to be within a few percent of the same value over a large frequency range. So they act approximately like resistors. So the recording environment is going to be the silver silver chloride layered on top of some sort of gel, layered on top of the epidermis, layered on top of the dermis, and more or less you can model the silver silver chloride electrode as a small battery in series with a small resistor the gel is going to be pretty much of a series resistor skin is going to look like some more complicated thing with some sort of capacitance and resistance and series resistance and so is the and we'll model just the dermis then is another layer of the same if you flex this thing in any way one of these resistances is going to change or one of these capacitances is going to change and you will therefore change the effective voltage seen out here so there's lots of ways that you can get a motion artifact from an electrode and typically the electrodes are immobilized somehow on the skin to try and minimize this motion artifact now for the EMG, you're going to get some motion artifact because you're moving, right? You can't just lay still like you would for a cardiogram. But the, the electrodes I'm going to give you are, are immobilized relative to each other on a big um, uh, adhesive sheet. So you peel this thing off, you smack it on your arm, and it should stay still because it's glued to you. Okay. Now, you, it's possible that one or two of you may be adhesive sensitive. Do any of you turn red when you put a Band-Aid on? I do. None of you do. You're probably not adhesive sensitive then. But uh, if, you, if you put one of these things on and then 20 minutes later you peel it off and you're bright red, don't put it on again. But you're going to minimize the motion artifact by effectively uh, gluing this electrode stack to your arm for the duration of the experiment. What would the motion artifact be? Motion artifacts, unfortunately, well, they're they're complicated because they're they're some sort of parametric. Mo they're some sort of motion related impedance change right? and it could tell you something about the impedance of the skin is if you could separate out the impedance change of the gel from the skin but it's pretty much it's it's something you want to avoid although that's interesting to find out if there's information actually carried in that sounds like a, another Google search So for this, uh, for this lab, you're going to have two sets of instrumentation. You're going to have the three leads attached to your arm, V plus, V minus, and ground, or not ground, zero, neutral, right? Not, not the grounded side, but the isolated neutral side. And then separately, you're going to have a, a pressure sensor or a force sensor that you're going to operate with the finger 
with the index finger that's a, that you're that you're instrumenting, or whatever muscle you decide to instrument. If you want to do your triceps, you could push up on something, right? Or you do chin ups. I don't care what you. So let's see, we've talked about electrodes, we've talked about isolation, talked about a little bit about force sensors, but not very much. What else do we need for this lab? I think that's it. Um, is there some way to get, get higher sensitivity out of the stretch sensors? Some way to get higher sensitivity? Well, um, that's fairly hard to do. Those are, those are fairly, they're not too sensitive. Uh, they're, they're getting, uh, what I was seeing is for a, a reasonable breathing volume, a 10% change in, in, in resistance. And that should be enough to be able to see a voltage signal coming off of it. Did you have trouble with that? <clears throat> but if you stretch it manually, it actually goes Right, but you're, not, you're just not stretching it much by breathing, right? You're only stretching it a few percent, but that suggests that a shorter piece of the material may have higher sensitivity because you're stretching it proportionally more. So it's probably not a good idea to use a piece this long, but rather a piece that long. But it's interesting to see if you can actually get the information out of the out of the uh, out of the plethysmograph waveform as opposed to the the breathing waveform. Let's see if I do have uh, information on the force transducer here. I think that thing warms up pretty fast. Did it turn on? Yes, it turned on. The problem is getting stable results with the plethysmograph. Stable results? What do you mean, stable mean results? results? Do you mean do you mean that? Um, no, I agree. It's changing. Do you do you mean that your your finger moves and the waveform goes all over the place? No matter how steady you try to be, um, it does go. Plus minus five to seven. Five to seven what? <clears throat> so, so how long a base period are you averaging over? Five seconds. I can't be better than twelve beats a minute, right? I mean, you can't. You have to. You have to average over at least twenty seconds if you want to get within three beats a minute, right? Because Otherwise, you just don't have enough baseline. And I would say that your natural variability, you can look this up, but your natural variability is probably uh, under just resting conditions if you're doing nothing and sitting there blankly staring at a white wall, it's probably going to be plus or minus three beats a minute. So that's not so surprising, but you do have to have a fairly long baseline to get accuracy, typically you're the the doctor if it, who, who is grabbing you're taking your pulse by measuring here times fifteen times fifteen seconds worth and then multiplies by four. So that's probably fifteen second baseline is probably a reasonable time to measure over. The uh, the force transducer that you're going to be using is looks like this. There's the the size reference. There's a connector on the bottom which is um, um, on 10 in tenth inch centers. They're fairly um, flexible. We have connectors that will plug onto those. So you don't have to solder to them. The way they're made is that there is a, uh, a, a, a carbon layer on one side, a spacer, and then little bumps on the other side. And the harder you squeeze, the more of these bumps come in contact with the carbon. 
and the force curve resistance in kilo ohms versus force oh it's actually it's log log linear <clears throat> with a slope of hmm the slope is just below one order of magnitude of resistance decrease for every order of magnitude of force increase of course grams is not a force measurement right it should be newtons but who's counting <clears throat> uh, so it looks like I don't know what that means up there since there's no data point up there I think it means it goes to infinity someplace down here but certainly from 20 grams or so up to to, to 10 kilograms you have a, a, a fairly linear plot which means that you should be able to take a couple of points and calibrate it pardon me? it's a log by log yeah it's log log so it's a so it's power law and the slope is almost minus one it's actually about minus point about minus point six yeah I think he's quite a bit actually and they seem to saturate well before ten kilograms I think ten kilograms is pretty optimistic I'm I'm only going by the force. Yeah, you're going to have to calibrate this. Yeah, they they uh, it probably depends a little bit on the force distribution also, because these things are. Um, you could imagine that if you put a lot of force right in the center with a with a nail, that you might get a different result than if it was uniformly loaded over the whole surface because of the nature of this. Right. If you're using cans to load it, though. You're going to get some weight on the spacer. What you're, what you're going to have to do is build a little, a little right, bump on top of it. Like you're going to put your thumb on it and put the cans on top of your thumb. Because right. your thumb is what, or your finger is what's going to push on it anyway, right? So you're, you're going to internally calibrate by using the same surface. Whomp! On top, you know, somehow. Or you could take the bathroom scale, turn it upside down, or put it on the table and press against it. Or the, or some other... Maybe they have a maybe they have a nice scale in Matins we can borrow. Could we put some pennies in there? Yeah, possibly. Pennies are maybe may maybe the right size yet yeah, for the for loading. Yeah, yeah. But yes, you're gonna there's 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 gonna be some problems with the force sensor calibration. You are gonna have to calibrate it. So, um, let me make sure I got, I think I got through all that stuff. So I thought we could talk a little bit more about, well, oh, yeah, more about op-amp circuits. Um, for the, if we do the, if we do the skin impedance lab, you're going to have to build a constant current source for, because what you're going to want to do is you're going to have some some chunk of your arm here and you're going to want to put some current on the arm and then measure the voltage across that structure so you can put some current through here and measure the voltage so it's going to be a four wire measurement V and then current onto the onto the arm Four wire measurement. I did that in silicon Pardon me? I did that I did that in silicon Yeah. Yes, Akshay? Did you have your hand up? Yeah, so does that assume that the current is anywhere else? Well 
the current is not going to go anywhere else but out of this electrode and into this electrode. So as long as you're measuring the voltage nearby, it should work. I mean, there's a lot of problems with this. Like I said, the last time I did it, it didn't work that well. People had a lot of problems with it. But you do need a current source here with a peak amplitude of maybe 10 microamps. If we say that the skin impedance is going to be a few k ohms, then we would expect to get a, uh, a few thousand microvolts out, a few millivolts out, so it's clearly measurable. Um, your skin impedance will vary quite a lot. Mine is commonly above a mega ohm because my hands are so dry. But by the time you put electrode paste on them, it's probably going to be lower than that. How would you make a 10 microamp constant current source for a 2K ohm load? Well, a constant current source just means it has an output impedance which is much higher than the load impedance, right? That says if you have some source, V source, some effective resistance of the source, and then some R load, which is your skin, that RS has to be much greater than RL so that no matter what RL does, the current doesn't change. So, if you just used a resistor, would it work? Let's say you had a 10 volt source here. which you have with your isolated power supply. You have a 10 volt source, actually a 12 volt source. You need a resistor which is much larger. How much it, what do we mean by much larger? Hmm. How accurate do you need the current source to be? Does it have to be accurate within a tenth of a percent, one percent, or ten percent? Any opinion? One percent seems good enough because uh, ten percent you could say, well, all right, you're, you you might be getting into the range where some other instrumentation would would where that error would dominate, but one percent is probably good enough. So that says that RS has to be a hundred times bigger than RL. Right? If this is two K, hundred times bigger is only two hundred K. That's clearly doable and easy. It's not very elegant. It's not what most people would call a constant current source, but it's good enough. How are constant current sources? How are constant current sources? Well, there's various kinds of constant current sources. For instance, And of course, they all depend upon feedback. Why don't we make an open? What? Why can't you make an open? You can. So one possibility is this is a constant current source. But this is your RL here. And this is some programming input, some VS. And this is RS. You know that this point has to be held at ground because this point is at ground, right? If this point is at ground, then the current that flows through here is completely independent of RL, right? So the current flowing in here has got to be VS over RS, exactly. But conservation of charge, because no current flows into this terminal, conservation of charge says that same exact current must be flowing out through the load. So you have now made a current source. No matter what you set this load resistor to, 
the current flow through it will be exactly the same. Now, there's limits. If you make this resistor so low that the op amp can't source the current, then the system will fail. If you make the resistor so big that the op amp can't source enough voltage, the system will fail. But as long as you stay in a region where you're not violating the current drive limits or the voltage drive limits of the op amp, then the resistance, then the current will be constant. You can. Uh, it's a little tricky because no, it's not so tricky. So uh, where's ground here exactly? Oh, that's that's virtual ground. So that's the only ground that gets attached to your prep. So you'd take the two sides of the op amp, you'd connect it to the human. So this is now the, 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 your arm. And this becomes the ground lead because it's at virtual ground. And then your two voltage leads get attached here and here for a diff amp. Where is VS again? Where do we connect VS? It's, it's to, whatever you what it, it could be. It could be a variable voltage. Yes, it's whatever voltage you want to set the current to. So if your power supply is plus twelve, that could be plus twelve. Then you have to choose RS appropriately to get about ten microamps, maybe twenty microamps through here. This is a very good constant current source. How good is it? What is the output impedance of this? Let's see, how do we calculate that? <clears throat> what matters is how accurately this point keeps is kept at ground, right? And as long as we're not as long as we don't violate the gain bandwidth, as long as we're close to DC, the error here is going to be given by something like A over 1 plus A, where A is the gain of the op amp. I, I can show you, I can prove that. But if A is on the order of 10 to the 6th, then the effective output impedance is going to be something like A times RS. So it's going to be 10 to the 6 times whatever resistance this is, which might be on the order of um, 100 kilo ohms. So it's going to be on the order of 100 mega ohms or a giga ohm or so. So the output impedance is really very high. Turns out you can do almost as well with a single transistor. You can build a transistor current source you want it, in this case, ground referenced. So let's see, we want to have V plus, we want to have a PNP transistor like this with RL here to ground. And you pr put in some programming voltage here, uh, VS. We're going to call this RS. Now in this case, the current that flows through, through the transistor is going to be exactly what is required to keep the emitter more positive than the base by 0.6 volts. So we set VS to some value the emitter value goes to Vs plus 0.6 volts and stays there independent of the current that flows through the system. 
And the reason this works is the high gain of the transistor. The gain of the transistor is in the order of several hundred for a small transistor. And so you would guess that since the gain is so high that even fairly large changes in current here are going to make a very small change in voltage here. And you could expect to have an output impedance on the order of tens of mega ohms or a hundred mega ohms even from a one transistor current source like this. You could use this. Pardon me? Uh, when does zero work in this case? There. It's zero. Okay. Another possibility. There's a thing. Uh, well, there's a there's a there's a a very famous current source called the Howland current source, but it requires matching between resistors, and so I'm not going to talk about it. Howland happens is the brother of a faculty member here in neurobiology. Uh, another current source which I like for fairly high currents is to break out the although this is actually a little less handy you have some RL here and RS here and VS here and With the high gain of the op amp, you're guaranteed these voltages will be the same. So this point is Vs, independent of RL. And so the current through here is constant, independent of RL. <clears throat> I'd say in terms of grounding, this is a little less handy. This one's pretty handy to do because of the virtual ground right here. But so is this one. For this, you'd probably use a 2N3906, of which we have a few hundred. This, you could use a 358 op amp. Be fine. LN358. Clearly, the current source is going to have to be isolated from ground. Right? Which means that if you need to control this voltage here, you're going to have to have the control isolated from ground. Measuring DC impedance on skin is not too useful because, first of all, the electrodes tend to drift because of, electro because of charging and also because DC tends to permanently change the parameters of your skin. So what you're probably going to put into here is actually a sinusoidal voltage generated by a sine wave generator or by, by the sound output channel of the computer. Isolated. So what you're going to have to do, thank you, for the lead in. So the computer generated square sine wave is going to have to be opto isolated going this direction back into the circuit that's attached to the human. So you're going to have an opto which is which is isolating the current and another opto isolator which is isolating the voltage reading coming back out. <coughs> So you're driving a lot. I mean, if you're if you're if you're if you're if you're, uh, uh, if you're driving current in one direction through any sort of biological structure, you end up piling up up, up ions in in the wrong places. That's sort of the. You know, I, there, there's a there, you tend to get a breakdown of the structure. You tend to kill cells. If you if you put a lot of DC through these structures, so a strong EMF would also induce sodium channel. Oh well, that's true. I mean, you get all kinds of Im immediate effects from a strong electric field. That's why an electric field hurts. Is that if you a strong enough electric field will directly stimulate action potentials in your pain fibers. 
they also, I, 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 have you ever, ever hooked yourself up to the mains by accident? What effects did you have? It hurt. It caused some muscles to jerk. Yeah. And, that's pro and that can be caused by either uh, you, can, you can stimulate the nerve which drives the muscles and causes the muscles to lock, or you can directly stimulate the muscle electrically and cause it to lock. Like a big vibration. That's 60 hertz, which you can sense. 60 hertz is within the, within the sensory uh, limits of your skin vibration sensors. 50 hertz also, yes. 230 volts. That's yeah, I did this uh, when I was three. I stuck two screwdrivers in a socket and grabbed it to pull them out. I remember that. Actually, what I remember specifically is flying backwards across the room which is apparently a result of I, I kicked really hard to get away from the effect and, and flew and was fl my mother walked into the room as I was flying backwards across the room. Explains much, doesn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, I don't, don't do that. Don't hook yourself up to 110, that really hurts. Um, but you can feel you can feel the 50 hertz or 60 hertz clearly, and um, it's above the twitch frequency of your muscles, but just barely. The your eyes can contract and relax in a few milliseconds, but these big muscles typically take a few tenths of a second to turn on and turn off, although. Younger people have faster muscles than older people. You tend to have a lot of fast twitch muscle when you're young, which has high peak strength and can move fast. And as you get older, you tend to replace that with slow muscle, which is, has better aerobic capabilities but doesn't produce as high a peak output. That's why you see a lot of distance runners who are still running when they're 60 or 70, it's all slow muscle. You don't have to do anything. It just has to, it has to be able to last a long time. It doesn't have to produce a lot of force. <clears throat> so, um, let's talk a little bit about filters. We got some, oh, there's, oh, there's a couple of other interesting topics here, too. No, let's talk about filters. So mostly what we've been talking about so far are RC filters and variants on RC filters, but RC filters are not very good. And you're probably going to find for some of this stuff that you want to you want to build better analog filters. A lot of what you're going to be doing is, is digital filtering. Should I talk about digital filtering too? Are you, are you, you all, do you, you took, all took 2200 or, or an equivalent course, right? Some sort of DSP course, no? Um, Who would like to define and discriminate for me infinite impulse response versus finite impulse response filters? Can anybody do that? Right, exactly right. So an infinite impulse response, the archetype of an infinite impulse response filter would be an RC low pass filter. If you put an impulse in here, which is to say a very narrow, very tall pulse, what you get out of here is, <coughs> excuse me, a transient followed by an exponential decay. Assuming this is a voltage source over here. You get a, a transient followed by an exponential decay. 
the height of the transient is proportional to the area of this pulse. And the decay time constant, of course, is proportional to R times C. In principle, the response to this filter lasts forever. So it's an infinite impulse response filter. In fact, most of the analog filters that you build are infinite impulse response filters. Can I come up with a physical finite impulse response filter? Hmm. Hmm. Do you know of any? I have to think about that. But mathematically, we're going we're gonna to take some input waveform and we're going to sample this thing. What you're doing when you put these waveforms into the computer is you're sampling at some dense enough rate that you believe you've captured the waveform dynamics. So you, and in, in practice, that means you have to sample at least four to ten times faster than the highest frequency component. The Nyquist limit says a factor of two faster, but that's uh, out outrageously optimistic. So you have, to fa you have to sample four to ten times faster than the highest frequency component. So you always have to analog filter. You always have to put an analog low pass filter in your signal here before you go into the A to D converter to make sure that you've gotten rid of all the higher frequencies. Otherwise, your data will be corrupted and you cannot retrieve the, undo the corruption. You must low pass filter always. And you've been doing that. For the pulse plethysmograph, there's a low pass filter built in. Right? There's a, there's a, a low pass that's set to something like what, 20 radians or 50 radians a second or something built in. <clears throat> so as long as you're sampling 30 or 40 times a second, you're probably okay. So, but once you sample this, then you have, a, you have a sample data waveform, which you hope reflects reality in some convergent way. And the operation of filtering this, of building any filter whatsoever, is, is a process of deriving an output from past inputs. You have to derive an output from the history of the inputs and the history of the outputs. And you don't know anything about the future. If you did, you wouldn't be in this class. You'd be playing the stock market. And so you have to def define an output at time n, at time n for the filter, which is going to be based on some set of x of n, the inputs. And now I'm using MATLAB notation here. But there's going to be some coefficient b1 times x at time n. So the output is going to, e is going to be a, some constant times the current input plus some other constant times the last input at the, at the time just before plus some constant times the input at the time two samples before out as many samples as you would like minus some A2 and there's going to be a lead coefficient here A2 times the last output of the filter minus some other constant A3 times the second to the last output of the filter and so on, as long as you far out as you would like to go. And every possible linear filter that you can build 
is described by this equation. In fact, let's make it linear time invariant filter. It's time invariant because the constants don't change with time. The B's and A's are constant. B's and A's are constant, so it's time invariant. And it's linear because all you have is the product of constants times samples, which is a linear operation. If any of the A's are non-zero, if any A is greater than zero, then we have an infinite impulse response filter. Because part of the output is being fed back to the next output. If all of the A's are zero, then we have a finite impulse response. finite impulse response filter. And you can see that. Let's say that we, we only have three non-zero coefficients here, B1, B2, and B3, and these are all zero. We put an impulse in at this time. We put an impulse in at this time. Two samples later, it's going to be at this time. Three samples later, it's going to be at this time. And the sum will be exactly zero. There are many mappings that have been worked out to convert or to, to relate digi analog filters, combinations of resistors and capacitors and op amps, to digital filters. They all result in infinite impulse response filters, digital filters. So. Working with IIR filters, infinite impulse response filters, is comforting because for us old guys that sort of started out with analog filters, we know what's going to happen with the, the, the IIR filter. It makes sense from the intuition built up by years of messing with RC filters. On the other hand, there are design tools that allow you to build quite arbitrary finite impulse response filters that can be arbitrarily good as long as you're willing to do enough arithmetic. The downside of a finite impulse response filter is it takes about 10 times as much arithmetic as an IIR filter for the same cutoff frequency. So, if you're working with low frequency signals and you have no time requirement, you always use a finite impulse response filter. If you're working with high frequency signals or you have a limited CPU po capability or limited CPU power, which you always do in real life because you have to have some sort of batteries or power supply, then you have to think very carefully about performance versus power. You're going, to get, you're going to get better performance out of a big FIR filter, but it's going to take more power. More energy, really. <clears throat> so I think what I should do is start talking about analog filters, and then we'll start talking more about digital filters. And what do we mean by a good filter? What do you mean by a good filter? Sharp cutoff. Sharp cutoff is one is one capability. So, by the way, you can you can program this up in about 15 seconds in MATLAB, this equation, and you can start substituting in any set of vector, any set of coefficients you want, and you will now have a new digital filter that nobody has seen before. 
Now, some of them have con common names. Let's say if, if all the b n are equal to, a, to 1 over n, if each of all the bn are equal to 1 over n, and all the an with n not equal to 1 equals 0, then we have a averaging filter. It takes the last n samples and averages them together. Right? <clears throat> you might guess that that's a low pass filter and you'd be right, except it's a very bad low pass filter. Nobody actually uses those. Well, actually, lots of people use them, but they shouldn't. <clears throat> but you can set up any set of coefficients you want, and you'll have a new filter that does interesting things. And most of them will be terrible. Because it's really hard to choose those coefficients correctly. And there is something like, uh, I don't know, a few person centuries of research that's been done to figure out what coefficients give you the best cutoff the flattest response, the best pulse waveform. So what do we mean by that? And let's talk about that next time. But the bottom line is nobody chooses these at random unless you're just fiddling around, I mean, which is entertaining to do. I've done that. You, know, you say, oh, I'm going to try and just add my own little pass filter. Ah. But but you use a design tool that's been optimized. And there's lots of them. But uh, we can talk about what constitutes a reasonable digital filter next time. Or analog filter first, then digital filter. Any last minute thoughts about what we should do for lab four? We, pardon me? The th thermometer now has two votes. Mm. Impedance measurement. You would do anything that measures off something off a, off a real system. Yeah. Could you do something like a Venetia's project with a respirometer? Oh, so the respirometer is, is, a t is a temperature measurement, actually, okay. which he was using a very small thermistor in a mask to get, to get, the, uh, get the breathing rate. Yeah. So there's a couple of possibilities for a thermometer then. Um, yeah, in that case, you need a thermometer with a fairly high response rate because it's got to cut off at a higher frequency than the breath. Uh, for, for measuring body temperature, the dynamics are very slow. The fastest I've ever seen somebody's body temperature go up is uh, maybe two degrees an hour. Is there something like a water vapor sensor? There are water vapor sensors. Humidity sensors? Yes. There are humidity sensors. They're generally fairly slow. There's also uh, um, uh, hydrogen sulfide detectors. And your breath has a fair amount of hydrogen sulfide in it. Uh, you know, parts per million. Unless you're sick, which in case it goes up. That was the main sensor in a charming project from 4760 three years ago or four years ago, which was the fart intensity detector. Yes, it was. It was. It was. Uh, it made. It made popular Science magazine. Uh, but um, my administration didn't think it was very dignified, for some reason. College of Farts and Sciences, yeah. That was the, co that was the lead, yeah. So, anyways, but, so there's various kinds of chemical detectors. Mostly, they, they do what you'd expect. Uh, temperature sensors are, uh, could be interesting for, you know, for breath dynamics. That's a possibility. I'll look into that. Anything else? Okay.